Hello and welcome to Raise Your Average. I'm Pierre Daly, Managing Editor at AdvisorAnalyst.com. My co-hosts are Mike Philbrick and Rodrigo Gordillo from Resolve Asset Management, SEZC. Our guest today is Steve Hawkins, President and CEO at Horizons ETFs Canada. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. Steve, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Pierre, thank you very much. And and it'll be a great show with Mike and Rod, uh, always entertaining individuals. Awesome. Not to mention yourself, (laughs) the legendary... Hawk. He's probably got the one of the best handles on Bay Street. Absolutely. He really is. <laughs> I appreciate that. And and Good some rip. of the best tapestries <laughs> that he puts on his back. Look at that shirt. Amazing. Yep. <laughs> it's all about the shirt game, Rod. Yep. Yeah, Always. I can't pull it off. I can't pull it off. I literally, this is the only thing the I can do. Game. Where's the party? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's horizon. Mosaic. Always and closely, you'll see some hidden message in there for sure. <laughs> so, to, Hawk, tell us about your uh, tell us about your career trajectory. How did you how did you rise to uh, such prominence in in the Canadian ETF industry? Where did it all start? Humble beginnings in uh, Newfoundland. Give us give us the uh, give us the scoop. Tell us everything. The lowdown. <laughs> Hey, I started working on Bay Street when I was uh, 15 years old, worked as a runner in a mail room and really, uh, really progressed myself from there, obviously. Uh, Had a lot of fun over the many years, but uh, really was on the sell side of the street for a long time until I got my first opportunity um, on the buy side with uh, Altamira Management uh, back in the, the early 90s. They were in a huge growth prospect. Um, you know, they wanted, I worked in sort of, uh, I worked in the trading floor and things like that, but I had progressed to a, a senior internal audit role and, and there was this new thing in, in the asset management system called compliance. Nobody knew what it was. And what uh, year was this? Compliance officer. <laughs> What? <laughs> this was 1993. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and nobody knew what a compliance officer was at that point in time. And, uh, and Altamira was sort of a leading uh, fund provider at that stage. And uh, they wanted to create a compliance department. And, and uh, uh, you know, I had a, a few friends there. And uh, they basically said, Steve, we want to hire you. And we want you to be to manage the, manage the compliance department and figure out what this compliance thing is. And, and, and sort of that was really the... The career path that took me off. I was very active in the asset management industry at that stage. I was doing a fair bit of public speaking, but I had I was you know running compliance. But running compliance, you have your finger in every single pie inside the company. Got me very involved in in understanding the the day to day activities of the trading of the PMs of the operations. Not to mention you know sales and marketing and all that kind of stuff as well. But uh, you know from there, I progressed myself personally. Um, and then ultimately, I, I, you know, I was working very actively with uh, one of our large institutional clients who said, Steve, we would really like you to come work for us. And uh, that was our biggest client at that stage. And, and, uh, and I took on a sort of a different role there. And I, I moved into more directly and actively overseeing the investment management process. And I became a CIO. And, and from there, I sort of progressed at a few different firms. Um, Horizons ETF sort of jo- was was created by Jovian Capital and, and Adam Fileski, Howard Atkinson, mm-hmm. um, and uh, that was their brainchild. Uh, but it was part of a bigger firm, and Jovian actually bought the asset management company that I was uh, president of, and, and sort of I was. Uh, Philip Armstrong always joked that I was the highest uh, uh, cost employee that they ever hired here <laughs> at Jovian and uh, uh, or at Jovian at that time, and uh, and then I sort of ran the investment management business of Jovian for a while, which was very integral to the operations of the Horizons ETFs. Um, and then and then the rules changed and the, the OSC said it is mandatory for an asset management company to have a compliance officer. And, and then it was like, I was the only guy who had the, the history and the uh, accreditation to be able to be the compliance officer. And I had to become the compliance officer for Beta Pro Management, which managed the leverage ETFs. And, and then... Sort of from there, it was really history. I was started working with Adam and Howard almost every day. 
uh, ran the day-to-day operations of the company very quickly. We launched some closed-end funds. I had a lot of closed-end fund history. Um, and then we were sort of converting things from closed-end funds to, to, to ETFs. We became the first issuer of active ETFs. And, you know, I had my investment background there. So uh, it, was a, it was a long time coming, but it really started in, in uh, working as a, a mailroom runner on Bay Street. And then... Wait, 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 wait. That, that mailroom runner thing, that, wasn't that the first yeah, yeah. chapter of, like, uh, reminiscence of a stock operator? Are you sure that's your <laughs> life or that, that particular <laughs> book? <laughs> I've heard that one way too often for that to be true. I, I, I you know, I, I had a little shirt and a little tie that was a clip on and I had a briefcase, which they gave me and I had to carry around stock certificates and bond certificates from this bank to Actual this bank paper. to settle trades. That's how this thing, this thing worked, wow. you know, physical securities. It was a different world for sure. So, so Steve, along that, along that journey, you have created a, a pretty exceptional culture at Horizons and I know you're you're not fond of of talking about yourself and your accolades, but where where do you think the the key insights have come, or what are your key insights about creating a great culture? Where'd you learn it, and what do you think your top two or three tenants are as you as you run Horizons ETFs? You know, it's hard to say, Mike, but uh, you know, I mean, the one thing that I pride myself is is talking to the people on a very regular basis, keeping them informed, not hiding. Um, things from people or keeping people in the dark when they don't have to, you know, this is not a, a, a business where like we're, we're growing mushrooms where we have to keep them in the dark and feed them manure. You know, this is, this is a business where we want people to participate and work as a team. Um, and I really try and support and promote the team effort everybody working together everybody asking questions i you know one of the things that i have loved about my career is coming into work every day and trying to learn something new or being forced to learn something new um and and knowledge i think is the absolute key to this business i think it all connects everybody together and people talking and learning is 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 the most important thing from a team perspective. And, and so knowledge, whether it's me saying what's going on, what I'm thinking, asking for everybody's opinion, you know, I, I, although I ultimately make the decisions on what we do and which way we're going, it's really getting that input from everybody else saying, hey, I'm thinking about this and this and this and this. And as a team, you know, give me all of your feedback. You know, I want this information. I have to try and distill this. And then from that, I try and make what I would be the best informed decision. I'm not always right, for sure, um, uh, but I have made some good decisions over the past years, and I, I really credit that to the team um, and the input that I get from them. Well, Matt Sack, do you, do you feel that, that thirst for knowledge and that candor um, that you promote within the firm is, is one of the, the sort of the key the keystones for the way Horizons has evolved and adapted over the years to sort of become the, the largest independent ETF, you know, offering shop in Canada? Is that or what are, what are the keystones there? I mean, I'm 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 very open about putting myself out there as an individual and as a firm and being able to work with people. You know, I pride myself on on being a very, very hard worker. You know, I used to be the first one in the office and the last one to leave the office. That's not the case anymore. Um, I'm still probably the last one here at the end of the day. Um, but, you know, when it talks to working with partners, you know, I try and talk to everybody. And this is... Uh, a, a relationship business. This has to be, you know, if somebody does you a favor, you've got to do them a favor. It's a very quid pro quo driven type of business as well. So it's really, it's working with a lot of people. It's having a lot of good relationships out there. It's if somebody does something for you, you have to make sure that you, you know, pay that back, you know, tenfold kind of thing. And I'm not talking like a commission dollar or something no. like that. It's just, it's, it's ideas, it's generation, it's working together. Uh, it's helping promote somebody or uh, a firm or uh, another career out there per se. Um, but it, it's really working from a team perspective internally and working as a team externally as well with all of your partners and business relations. Yeah, you know, I think that, uh, again, you know, I know you don't like to, to hear this, but 
one of the things that I see as a, a key aspect of the success of Horizons is that your personality is uh, generosity of spirit, right? Like you said, it's not generosity of, of you know, necessarily dollars exchanging, but, but giving yourself to the community, giving yourself to your partners, actually listening and trying to make it work. We're, we've been partners for a few years now with um, some of the ETS that we sub advise for you, uh, with you guys. And it's clear to me that that generosity is a key thing. And then when I talk to everybody else at Horizons, it has trickled down for sure. Um, so I think from a management perspective, I know a lot of advisors are listening to this. That is, especially people that are leaving the banks and starting their own businesses, that would be a key thing to take away from uh, from what I know about Hawk. So uh, yeah, very much, very much doing a good job there. My friend. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's get off the hawk flock. Okay. Let's talk about me. So, uh, what are my favorite traits? Your favorite traits about me specifically? I, I, <laughs> you first, Pierre. I'm teasing. I'm sorry. Well, to you know, you as off, you know, guys, I like the work hard, yep. play hard no. sort of attitude. So yep. I'm not one to shy away from entertaining and, and being out there, but putting myself out there both mentally and physically for the purposes of uh, of the enjoyment yeah. of others so uh it's 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 all about working together though at the end of the day that's awesome now how do you how do you go through the process at horizons of um you know sort of idea generation filtering and then the potential execution so so horizons has so often been on the vanguard of so many investment ideas and thoughts and some of them don't work as you said so you have to close them down or whatever but many of them have been you know smash successes whether we want to talk about marijuana the recent uh, uh foray into psychedelics uh uranium i think is another one where you know a highly underrated under loved asset class and you guys launched an etf in, in sort of the tail end or in the midst of a huge bear market in that space how do you go through that how do you you know sort of get the idea filter it think about the execution is there is there a process there that you can share with us there's no magic to this, but it really does come down to one, you know, we are very innovative. We pride ourselves on innovation. Innovation is our capital, is our primary slogan. And we try and preach that every single day, um, per se. But, you know, we listen to people. We listen to our clients. We listen to, you know, uh, stock boards. We listen to, we get emails constantly about this and this and this. We listen to our business partners saying, Steve, this is really interesting. Maybe you should think about this. We listen to our clients and then they say, uh, you know, have you thought about this? You know, is that possible? And I am not one to shy away from something hard, something that somebody has not done before. And I think that's probably, you know, there's a lot of people that run around in this marketplace um, that are, are scared to take any sort of risk at all. I mean, you mentioned another the name of another company, even though in a in a different frame of light, and and you know that's somebody that I refer to as sort of as the Walmart of ETFs, and it's nothing against Walmart. Everybody shops at Walmart. Everybody loves Walmart for certain things, right? But they're not going to be on the leading edge of the psychedelics industry or the marijuana industry or the Bitcoin industry, you know, from a cryptocurrency perspective. You know, there are there are people that like to, uh, you know, that, that put their money where their mouth is, right? And we pride ourselves on innovation, putting ourselves out there. And, and it's not easy a lot of times to, to make these decisions to say, we're going to do this and we're going to do it first and we're going to do it the right way. And, 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 and there's a lot of research that goes into that, but it really is listening to people. It really is listening to our partners. You know, uh, there's a lot of part, smart people that work at all of the banks here in Canada. They don't necessarily have the ability to do the things that we want to, um, but they can give us great feedback on how we necessarily might want to structure this, or it could be more efficient with this, or, you know, uh, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. And, and again, I have a great team um, behind me as well. And, and, you know, it's, it's working with the team. It's sitting down, it's planning these things out. But at the end of the day, Mike, the very first thing to answer yeah. your question is we listen. Right. And, and that's what we and, try. Yeah. And, and you've done a great job. It shouldn't be underestimated on the structuring side too. Something that you sort of mentioned implicitly in your comments, I would, I would suggest is explicit. The structuring and some of the products you've done over the years has been extraordinarily thoughtful and effective and answers a lot of questions for, um, 
individual investors, whether that's on the tax side or otherwise, it, it's been very interesting watching that evolution. Yeah, well, we make mistakes, but we learn from those mistakes, and we never make the same mistake twice. You know, that's you know what you know when the volatility market blew up three years ago. I mean, we were right in the heat of it. We were the only product provider in Canada in this space, and then we learned that we had to adapt and change from that. Then the oil last year. I mean, when crude oil went crazy and negative for the first time in history, you know, that really impacted us as the, as the biggest crude oil product provider here in Canada. And, and we had to learn and adapt. And, you know, ultimately we're, we're uh, you know, seeing some success from that. But we also saw a lot of fail, failure and structuring and restructuring that we had to think of and, and move. So forward. let's talk about well, in, innovation isn't free. Yeah. Right. That, that's one thing. Just, just as a final thought, innovation isn't free. It's a mindset you have to bring to the table and it has its own slings and, and arrows that are that accompany it. But, it, you know, that, that's it, you, you've you've car, carved out an amazing niche in the industry in, in being yeah. able to. I, I want to say that innovation. For well, sure. let's wait, talk wait, about wait, embracing failure. Oh, sorry. I, I just want to. Yep. Um, you know, I just just to go back go ahead, to where you know, Horizons, where you launched the the first marijuana ETF and, and then, of course, the ensuing success that came with it afterwards. I think there's two ways to look at it. I mean, I, I love the fact that you guys are independent and, and you're able to do things that, that the big banks and, and other, you know, um, large institutions, the, you know, the behemoths, I mean, absolutely won't touch or can't touch. You know, on, on one hand, people can view that and say, oh, well, they can do whatever they want. They're independent. But on the other hand, I mean, from inside, it must have been um, an extremely difficult decision to make as well to say, uh, yeah, that's a really novel idea. Let's, let's just jump in and do it. Let's do the bold thing. But there was a lot of, there was a lot of um, sort of inherent uh, perception risk as well, right? Like, what if we do this and it turns out to be the, the most colossal mistake ever, uh, right? I mean, and so, so you know, it, it, had to be, it had to be a very well thought out, you know, well researched decision in order to, to actually have the courage to do it. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, let's do this. This will be a great idea. What a, what a progressive area to invest in. It's, it's, it's as bold as, as the activists have been on legalization. I mean, sometimes you, when you're talking about a subject matter like that, I mean, you're just running into roadblock. It's, it's, this is a great idea. We should talk to these people. No, 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 you can't do that. And you ask somebody else, no, 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 you can't do that. Like, I like people when they tell me, no, I can't do that because that just keeps me thinking. And how are we going to restructure this? How can we move something like this forward? Um, and, and, you know, to Mike's point, uh, you know, I don't mind making mistakes. I tell my staff every single day, I don't mind if you make a mistake. You just can't make that mistake twice. Here with us, you know, we put a lot on the line when we have come to market with the first, you know, leveraged products and things like that. And, and we have put ourselves out there from a self-directed investor perspective. You know, the only volatility ETF provider, the, the primary marijuana ETF provider, you know, first yeah. globally thinking about it, but we've run into roadblocks after roadblocks after roadblocks. And it's really, you know, talking with the team, sitting down, how can we overcome this? How can we overcome that? Working with our partners, restructuring things. Um, and, and there is a significant process that you have to go behind the scenes. And, and uh, you know, the one, I, I just, when I have a, I'm a dog with a bone sometimes and I won't let go of an idea if I really want to get something done, I, I have always been the doer. My job from day one, even under different management here, was to get <laughs> X done. And, I think you can say um, shit. <laughs> shit, 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 shit. No, man. You can get this is right done. after I, friends. We I can't was do that. It's time. That was my job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I got stuff done every single day. That was my job. And then people think about things, they throw it up on the, on the drawing board, and it's like, Steve, can we do this? And I'm like, I'll figure it out. And we would so, get it done. And that, that's what I... So I, what is, you know, what is the driving. perception ahead, that the different quote unquote partners that you have, uh, have of you like that. How, how, what's your relationship with the very conservative banks out there? Cause when you're the guy pushing for the thing and the dog with the bone, putting up the, the latest and greatest that everybody's terrified to do. Otherwise the ETF providers within the bank would have done it. What's, 
how, how does that relationship work with, with, for you? The, ba the banks and Horizons. Yeah, do you have you a do good that? relationship? Is it contentious? Is it like... I, well, I, it depends on the bank, but and it depends on and what area of the bank as well. Like there, there are some parts of the banks that are like, Steve, I can't believe you did that. You know, got to shake your hand. Even the most conservative banks are, Steve, we love this. We, you know, I will do this personally, but I can't, you know, I can't put my clients into this, uh, unfortunately, because the bank won't let me, right? Like, and, and that's really the way the investing in marijuana stocks was for the first, uh, you know, three years kind of thing. Um, you know, there's some banks that are, are leading in some spaces and there's some banks that the trail, but I would say there's, there's people at every single bank that are, uh, strongly promoting and, and happy that we've done or that we've taken these steps and really pushing the envelope from an ETF industry perspective, what clients can access, what, what they can use for their clients. Um, and then there are parts of the bank saying, these guys are insane. They shouldn't be doing this. They're, they're going to put a black mark on the whole ETF industry, you know, and there are people that are saying our leveraged ETF business, those aren't ETFs. I'm like, how is it not an ETF? It, it you know, provides direct access, you know, for very committed individuals. You might be rolling the dice and saying you think that oil is going to go up tomorrow and that gas is going to go down, but it's still an ETF which gives you direct access and the opportunity to profit, protect, or lose money based on your personal view. And that's what investing is. It's giving people options. Um, and, you know, I mean, psychedelics was something that people, it wasn't even on the radar of this, the global ETF industry until we put our hand up and said, you know what, we can do this. We're talking to our clients. This, this is a, a new asset class, which is evolving very, very quickly. Um, and I don't like to use the word evolving, but it's, uh, you know, it was young. Um, and, and it was, it was good. we believe that it had all of the attributes of a new sector that could grow very, very quickly and was going to be so beneficial from a global perspective to the social persona for what we do, you know, when there's 700 million people globally that are suffering from some form of mental illness, you know, depression, anxiety, um, you know, it, this type of, you know, drug or drug therapy, which could have such implications for so many different people. Like we haven't seen something like that in a long time. And there's new stocks coming on board all the time. We're having more and more IPOs. We got companies now like Canadian companies listing themselves in NASDAQ. Um, it's great for the psychedelics industry. I'd sell that, you know, but the capital markets were, it was very, very earlier stage and it was the banks weren't involved in this space at all. It was still, you know, all the independent, dealers that were coming to marketplace with the with these new companies well, what are, what are, but that market has yeah. quickly progressed yeah walk, since walk us through that i mean for me it was michael pollan's book um you know i think it's how to change your mind Ch changing your and mind i think it's a you know uh changing your mind yeah and 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 that really kind of got me over the over the line on this and i, I thought well this is going to be a repeat of marijuana in the way that they're going to go about the legalization treatment and whatnot and did your did your experience with marijuana lead you to a more quick conclusion or an early earlier entry into psychedelics? Because it seems to yeah. me you you built an ETF very early days. Yeah, Hawk. Did your personal experience with marijuana versus, versus marijuana? <laughs> did your personal experience with marijuana influence <laughs> your personal experience with psychedelics? Wait, I gotta I gotta break them off and roll it here. Um, uh, he's he's speaking from a place yeah. where all of that is perfectly legal. So uh, he, he could, in Canada, growing marijuana in your office. Is what what legal. are the <laughs> what are ah, the uh, so was, it didn't used to be. <laughs> was it was it informative though? Was that informative to the those psychedelics? Uh, and, and how did you like, you know? Because it was so new. How did you like? It seems to me the companies are so small still. But how, walk us through that. Well, I mean, even when we created HMMJ, um, you know, there was only like 13 companies that we invested in, you know, and, and some of them were very micro cap um, and some of them were the larger, like the, the canopies and the afries and the roars. I think we had a, a, a broader base of of mid to larger, I'm going to say cap, but, it, you know, when you're dealing with a marijuana company that every one of them is under a billion dollars, they're all of a certain size, but you had 
a lot of different opportunity to invest in them. And it was very difficult for us to create an index and an ETF from a diversified investment portfolio perspective uh, to, to get access to this concept. So we, we had to think a little bit outside the box. We had to throw in the Scott's miracle Grow and things like that, that added a little bit of stability to the portfolio, that we're large cap, that we're not going anywhere. You know, and that's where, you know, we have Johnson & Johnson, we have Abvi. Um, we're actually adding, adding a third larger big pharma drug uh, company with this current rebalance in psych. But we learned a lot from the launch of HMMJ and the creation of an index. Actually, one of the reasons why we, we made the index for psych uh, a proprietary index. So it's a horizons index rather than a third party um, group like Selective or S&P or MSCI, because there was really, we've had to change the underlying index for HMMJ eight times through, you know, global market comment and stuff like that with Selective, we were able to like build all of those changes and rules that we learned through that whole process of a young, very, very early stage sector um, to what it has grown today where, you know, I mean, at one point in time, we had almost a hundred companies in, in the marijuana index and we could have gone more if we'd wanted to kept the rules the same. And we needed to sort of pair that back here we, again, with psychedelics, uh, there's more and more IPOs coming almost every single day. We got another big one coming this week, um, and you know we had to learn. We had to basically build this index and build the rules, trying to keep it as a passive as possible still, um, but be adaptive as this new young sector grows and could grow very very quickly. So, you know, you think it's early stages on a relative basis, but when you actually look at what the marijuana market looked like, it, it's very, very comparable from a timing perspective. We're just running into less roadblocks now because, you know, the thing about psychedelics is, you know, ultimately these are not uh, recreational per se, right? These are prescribed uh, drugs that are going to be administered by psychiatrists and psychotherapists, you know, legally. You have to you know, go to a pharmacy and buy it. You can't go to a dispensary and, and just figure out, you know, which one of these, you know, uh, levels of CBD or, or THC that you want to get access to. Mm -hmm. Do I want to be mellow tonight? Do I want to be really high tonight? I want to party, um, you know, and, and people think about that when they're thinking about magic mushrooms and LST and ketamine based um, drugs. But this industry is very, very different because of the, non-recreational applications of psychedelics versus the fully recreational, not fully, but the, the, the less, uh, you know, therapeutic applications of cannabis itself. I suppose the, um, the interaction with the drug use and the, the sort of, um, participation of a therapist along the way really solidifies that relationship. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, I mean, Obviously, the illicit drug market, you know, globally is, is a huge thing, and, but cannabis was primarily looked at as an illicit recreational drug until legalization here in Canada, per se, but it was, it's really the conversion of that illicit marketplace into a legal marketplace. And, like, I can't tell you, like, I live right downtown Toronto. The number of dispensaries available to me are like Tim Hortons now. Like there is just, it, you cannot walk around, you cannot walk one block without a new dispensary uh, being available um, and, and you can just walk in and buy cannabis. That is not the case for psychedelics. The, you know, we're going through full FDA approval, full Health Canada approval, and it's a different value proposition. Do you, do you think it will be though? Do you think that eventually there, it will lead to a recre recreationalization of some of the psychedelic... Um, molecules uh, down the road i think there is a possibility that we could get there but we got to get the governments comfortable first in being able to prescribe this type of medicine and work you know but but the the, the process of psychotherapy involving psychedelics right now is a very long process like you have to sit down with your psychotherapist for like six meetings and then you got to go through a, a four-hour um 
process of them using the drug and putting it into your system. It is not just going out and buying a joint and, and smoking it and, and getting the immediate benefits to it. So, you know, the use of the psilocybin and the LSDs and the ketamine, um, uh, MDMA, you know, these are all things that people have all thought about from a, you know, rave and ecstasy perspective kind of thing. But this is a different marketplace. And although we'll be, you know, there'll be a target of some of that, this is really a social benefit drug from the perspective of curing illness. And, and that's, it's not going out to have a party, which is very, very different. Yeah, uh, it's been a massive breakthrough for the uh, psychotherapy. I mean, it's not, the, really the, um, the antidepressants that exist out there in anti-anxiety medicine hasn't done better than placebo in trials are slightly better for a few decades. They've always yeah. been stuck there for 50 years. So, yeah. And so over 20 years. the, yeah. I think what's, what was interesting is what pushed him in the U S anyway, over the ledge was the amount of PTSD cases of soldiers coming back that were committing suicide or, or not just not getting over. They weren't making any progress whatsoever. And then the combination of these different drugs and different therapies and approaches to, to integrating the experience really has led to a massive breakthrough. Right. So from a compassion perspective, it's a completely different ball game sure. than than the marijuana space for sure. And I and I didn't answer part of Mike's question before. I was like, you know, what stirred this on? And I think really it was a couple of years ago and John Hopkins came out with a, a you know a, some massive research that they did that actually showed that there were very, very specific tangible benefits to the you know microdosing of LSD to the use of psilocybin um, to the use of ketamine uh, for treatments yeah. of yeah. anxiety depression major depression and yeah. PTSD as you as you mentioned Rod like the like these are things that are affecting so many Americans and for then such a, a a reputable institution like John Hopkins to basically turn around and do a one eighty which was the real first advancement in almost twenty five years into mental illness and the, and the, the betterment and, and curement of, of mental illness. Yeah. So, you know, no. this is not going away. Yeah. You know, this is only going forward from the, here. The hospice care too, I think was another major realization in that, in helping people cope with the, the eventuality of their demise, yeah. uh, oncoming um, demise, which I thought was an interesting way. And, and the, I think Michael Pollan covered that in his book too. You know, he, he expected to get significant pushback from the medical community and he's instead he got um, actual acceptance and uh, and and the sharing of frustration with the drugs that exist currently and that, that book i think is four or five years old but you know that the, the whole healthcare system around mental health was quite frustrated with the lack of progress over the last several decades for sure for sure and this is not the first sector where we see something like this and see where you know change is needed an investment from a capital markets perspective in, is in, is needed, and and that's also one of the sort of things that we're very looking at, like what can have a social impact on our day to day lives on a going forward basis. There's a lot of talk about the environment and social change and things like that, and I think ESG is going to be something that we have to consider in in our investment decisions a lot on a going forward basis. But technology, like this past year and what COVID has sort of spearheaded and forced us to change the way we do business on an everyday basis, technology itself is really going to be one of those drivers. And, you know, something that we talked about, uh, you know, we've talked about before is, is what is going to drive technology? What are you, what's going to support the next ideas for technology? And it's around innovation and we love innovation. But where does that come from? And, you know, it's one of the reasons why tomorrow and, and it, uh, you know, for you guys uh, that are listening to this um, uh, other times, you know, June 22nd, we're launching Canada's first semiconductors ETF. Um, and, you know, there are, there are, we just think semiconductors are the brains behind technology and innovation. And they're going to be, you know, powering, you know, our phones that are the way we drive, uh, you know, the, the way we get our, our carpets vacuumed, you know, every single day, chips, uh, is going to be involved, semiconductors are going to be involved in our lives from a technology perspective. And, and that's one of the reasons, again, we're, we're, I'm shocked that nobody else has launched 
a semiconductor yeah. here ETF here in Canada. Yeah, some one, big some ones big in the ones US around yeah. the world kind of thing. But you know, Canadians need a Canadian product, and that's why awesome. you know we're we're launching CHPS tomorrow oh, here um, on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And and congrats on that. And so so as you built out CH. P.S. Did you go the route of a more passive index? Are you taking an active stance? How are you gonna How are you gonna look at the formation of the underlying securities for that? So we're we're looking at this uh, definitely more passively. Uh, though we use uh, we are using a, sort of an AI overlay to help us work with the index provider. To you know anybody who's sending out news. Uh, releases and uh, uh, management reports and stuff like that, and they're talking about semiconductors generally, that puts them into a universe of potential uh, opportunities, and then there's more research that's done behind that from the index provider, and then you know we're working with the index provider. But we really try to keep this sort of as a global, um, uh, a large cap global underlying uh, portfolio and and it was a lot easier to do than psychedelics where we're having to deal with you know when we first launched PSYK we had some stocks that were trading at 12 cents and 13 cents you know here we're dealing with every company has at least a billion dollars US of a market cap very different uh, prospects for building an index and, and something passive so we wanted companies though that are very very focused on semiconductors pure play semiconductors um, and so that was very easy to do with the, the breadth of this marketplace, though it is sort of dominated by, you know, a few yep. Taiwanese and Asian based companies like, uh, you know, Taiwan Semiconductor. Um, but, you know, something new, something different for Canadian investors to uh, very, very specifically invest in. Have, have you given some thought to being being innovative, uh, being a leader in Canada on the active side? Have you given any thought to sort of the ARK Invest approach and um, sort of maybe being more active uh, inside the ETF with the look throughs and things like that? You know, they they do they have some uh, bands with which they can operate. They, they don't you know if they get lots of money and they don't have to actually buy the same portfolio. They can give the market makers sort of a different portfolio as funds come in and they can reposition the portfolio. Is there anything like that going on at Horizons or is that already kind of baked into the active managers that are already there making those calls? Yeah, we haven't gone to very specific mandates like that. It's more sort of strategies as a whole. Um, you know, like Kathy Wood's done a great job at ARC. I've known her for many years. I thought she was going to have a very tough time and she did until, you know, COVID happens and it changes the entire investment landscape in the marketplace, which was fantastic for her and very, very happy for ARC generally. You know, they have a spinoff here in Canada, which, uh, you know, sells the ARC ETFs through a, through a Canadian wrapper kind of thing. Um, is there other opportunities for, for very specific strategies like that? I think it's really based on the underlying person and the talking head nature. And she's done so well in the U.S. like over the past year. I mean, she is a go-to speaker on CNBC and, and, and Bloomberg News and things like that. And that's great from a self-promotion perspective. It's hard to get that in end strategies without very specific targets kind of thing. And like, you know, we love working with you guys. And, and I think, uh, you know, Mike, when you go on BNN, uh, it's, it's, I'm always taping it in, in the TV in front of me and watching it and listening to you and listening to your thoughts. Um, but it's very hard to sell the adaptive al asset allocation strategy specifically to an investor. It's like, well, what is that all? Yeah. What is that? Like, you know, when, when it's the ARC technology ETF and we we know that it's up 150% year to date and it owns, you know, a, a crap load of Tesla in it. Um, you know, that's, it's, a, it's a much easier talking points than um, like the Canadian ETF industry is – uh, it's an industry that has to be sold. It's not bought like the U.S. I mean, we're dealing with a, an overall investment base, which is less than one-tenth the size of the American populace of investors. And again, you know, we're dealing with financial advisors and self-directed clients that want to understand what it is that they're investing in. And you need to talk to them. You need to be a person. You need to give them an idea. And, you know, when you're dealing with I would say themes. I think the the Canadian investor is changing the way that they're looking at that kind of thing, and and you know, the COVID really sort of has helped uh, democratize 
investing here in Canada. It has really given a lot of empowerment to the end investor here in Canada. Um, and it, is, it has made them look at, well, I don't need to be invested in balanced mutual funds offered by this company anymore. I should be taking a little bit more of an active approach. I should be looking at fees. I should be looking at themes. I should be looking at asset allocation. I should be able to rotate my own asset allocation. And how can I do that really easily and efficiently and cost effectively? ETFs. Hence why we believe ETFs is the way of the future from an investment product to choice perspective. We've never launched a mutual fund. We're only an ETF business. And, and that's why we're working with you guys at Resolve. And, and you know, we're happy to be a partner with the uh, yep. with HRAA and the uh, our adaptive asset so allocation strategy. One question I have with regard to that whole space, um, uh, you know, you, you have – a unique advantage from the perspective of being innovative and, you know, the team structure and taking everybody's opinion. But there's also some structural differences between Horizons and every other ETF company. Um, what, what are those advantages that you've been able to kind of almost monopolize, <laughs> no? And how did you get there? <laughs> You, you want me to give away the secret sauce? Like, I don't know if I can do that. Like, yes. Yeah. No, no, no. Just, just tell the them. Caramel just, just list, list the ingredients, but don't tell them the proportion of each. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what was the question again, Rod? Um, <laughs> Um, you know, this is, uh, uh, again, you know, we, I think the single biggest thing here is our uh, propensity to take risks, to do something different than somebody else, than most other people. Um, there's a lot of people that will take the avenue of just throwing a hundred things up against the wall and maybe one of them sticks, you know, going back to listening to people and things like that. I mean, that gives us, you know, we've launched uh, almost 200 ETFs over the course of my career here of, of 15 years at, at Horizons ETFs. We only have 94 currently listed on the stock exchange. I mean, we've launched and closed and launched and closed. Um, but there are a lot more mutual fund companies that have thrown a lot of different strategies up and then ultimately closed those. And we see that, you know, sort of as the way of the Dota board. We really like to do our research and figure out whether or not a strategy is going to work, whether or not we have a client who is going to help seed and back and promote uh, these types of products. And like that, that's why we like working with you guys from a strategy perspective, because you're out there banging on the doors as well as my sales team. And yeah. you're helping promote an idea. Um, you know, that's easy for ARC to, to your point, Mark, because Kathy Wood is on, on TV all the time. She's promoting these concepts, these ideas, and and just like that, you know, people are, oh, Kathy Wood, you know, I like here, Mike Philbrick, you know, like, what does Mike Philbrick do? Like, and, 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 and we get to the bottom of what Resolve is, but then we have to go out, well, I'm interested in what's this HRAA thing, and then it's like, okay, now we got to sell it. Now we got a little hook, right? And, uh, and we got to think about it. There, there's not a lot of ideas where that just happens, and it's, and it's bought, and it's bought, and it's bought. Marijuana was one of those. Psychedelics has been one of those. Bitcoin cryptocurrencies this year with, with Bitcoin and Ethereum is definitely one of those. But there have not been a lot of successes like that, um, you know, over the past five plus years in the ETF business. So, so what I'm hearing is that there's, well, what I perceive it as is that there's this execution alpha at Horizons, which is doing hard things um, that are difficult to bring to market. And then you bring them to market and there's, you know, it's almost like a VC model. Some of them are, there's a few that are massively successful. There's that belly of the curve that is, you know, does well or has its ebb and flow. And then there's a few that don't work out and you, you soldier on, but, yep, you, but you've got to sure. be able to sure. be willing to do the work. And that's, I think where the, the excess return comes from the excess um, corporate opportunity for the ability to embrace that hard thing that, you know, obstacle is the way, if you will, and fight through it in order to offer unique and differentiated uh, investment opportunities yeah, for and, investors. And I think it's an, an interesting, for uh, sure. For sure. I mean, I, I, go, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Rod. I was going to say like, like I push my team and I push them hard. Sometimes when I really truly believe in something, I'm like, this is happening. This is what we're going to do. And you just need to get your head around what you need to do to make sure that that's done. 
Um, and, and this is the deadline I'm giving you to do it. And they're like, no, 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 I can't meet that. I need, you know, an extra two weeks. I need an extra month. And, and I'm like, no, like whatever it else it is, you got to get your day job done. And this is what you got to figure out, uh, right here to get this done. And you know what? Sometimes I push people a little hard, but you know, at the end of the day, people get rewarded for working hard and, and people learn things from working hard. They, they learn from, I got to do this outside the box. I can't figure this out the way that I normally do things. And, and again, pushing people to learn is so very important in this industry. And I think one of the reasons why people like working here, people like, you know, I mean, we're, we just won fun provider of the year. Um, and a lot of that is the team and the, the dynamic of the work atmosphere that we promote here at Horizons. Um, people, when they leave Horizons <laughs> ETFs, and there's not that many that do, but when they leave Horizons <laughs> ETFs, they always... And you know hire them, hire them back so you can teach everybody you know, else to so, listen. <laughs> I love that you have the Yoda approach. There is no try. I, I you do. one saying, <laughs> you're dead to me. <laughs> if, if you leave me, you're dead to me. But, you know, and, and people know that about me. I joke about it. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's not. But, you know, I, I love the fact that I get, always get an email from somebody who's left me to take, you know, a little bit more money here or they think is a better opportunity there. And it's like, damn, I That's wish great. I'd stayed at Horizons ETFs. Well, it really speaks to the, the idea of, of communicating not only – you know, the potential opportunity, but the fact that you don't have all the answers and that the team is there for you to push them for those answers to help you make better decisions. And it's not about you. It's about the accomplishments of the group, which you come back to over and over again. Um, I think yeah. there's a, there's a public perception that a lot of time that it, it's about me, but I, I, I like being the spokesperson. I like being the, the biggest salesperson to help push something forward from an individual concept perspective or just from a team perspective. And again, I, I don't like to be self-promotional because I really truly believe it is the team at Horizons ETFs that makes us the better company uh, from a putting product well, there, together, there's no, putting uh, product out there and, and putting it on the shelf for the Canadian investment public to have access to. I was. Right, gonna, you were going to say something earlier, and I cut you off. Apologies. There's really, there's really. I forgot. Uh, so Pierre, go ahead. There's no substitute for leading by example. <laughs> and go um, ahead, Pierre. Working with Rod and Mike and and Adam, one of the reasons we really are loving our relationship with them is that you know there's such a dedication to education. You know, but even after being an advisor for 15 years, I realized that I knew absolutely nothing. And um, and and then and then you know the longer you're at it, the the, the, the longer you're in this business, the longer you real you know the the edge of the wedge you know that 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 you do know the known knowns and then there's the known Thin unknowns and the wedge. unknown unknowns that that wedge just gets thinner and thinner and thinner with every year and but I love I love you know I love what I love what Horizons is doing I love what uh, Rod and Mike and Adam are doing at Resolve because they're 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 really taking on the, the bold challenge. Um, that no one else wants to because it, it is difficult. But once you once you understand it, it makes perfect sense. And and it's you know you, you become more and the more you are exposed to it, the more indoctrinated you are to the idea that so much more needs to be done than what's actually being done. And that's why it's the portfolio construction and you know uh, adaptive asset allocation and risk parity and. You know, all of these these very uh, sophisticated strategies are more necessary than ever. I just think that, uh, you know, like you said, Hawk, you have these, these thematic ETFs that kind of sell themselves and you kind of have to go after that. But your structure provides such an opportunity to to really create liquid alternatives, actively manage liquid alternatives that maybe your internal team can't or doesn't have the time to educate themselves on and then go out and, and be the pure play expert on that. So the partnerships that you've made with the liquid alt managers within your platform have been kind of interesting. So you got hack, you know, the, the seasonality ETF, you know, with a very uh, uh, educational tilt. I remember meeting uh, the guys early on and they were giving me their books and I read right through it. They were great and charismatic individuals. And of course, you know, that's an interesting way to deal with it, right? Because that's normally what an individual asset management has to do on their own because nobody else wants to do it for them. No ETF company wants to launch a complex um, ETF and a complex strategy, but you've been able or you've been willing and, and uh, kind enough to partner with guys like Thatchik and uh, Resolve 
and allow us to partner with you in that education, right? So that's that's been interesting. And you provide a structure. Um, being able to trade futures in Canada is nearly impossible, but the structure that you provided allowed us to provide to, to give access to investors something that would otherwise be really impossible to do without launching an OM fund. Well, and investors, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, we're trying to help the end investor uh, make better choices and give them the tools um, to, to make those choices. And, and uh, you know, working, a lot of Canadian investors want access to futures, but the difficulty in opening a futures account is is immensely from a, a paperwork and, and a, a tax perspective, risk management perspective. And the fact that we can partner with group like and a tax perspective and the fact that we can partner with a group like you guys who are very uh, that I would say are futures aficionados and, and uh, you know, you live in this space every day. And to and it's almost like a preferred share manager. I mean, there's so many different preferred shares. There's so many different types of preferred shares out there. You need you want to invest in preferred shares. You need a professional money manager that's going to give you access to the strategy that's living in this world all day long. And it's the same with futures trading and what you guys are doing. So, I mean, yes, we have some products that'll let them do it on their own and, and get access to some very very specific underlying asset classes or sectors or, or commodities themselves. But at the end of the day, like I don't mind trading that I'm in and I'm out and I'm in on a day basis, but I'm, I'm not going to long-term invest into leveraged oil up. Um, you know, I would rather let you do that for me because you're watching it and you know when to rotate it from oil to gold to net gas to volatility to the S&P 500 to T-bills, you know, and, and having a strategy that, accomplishes all of those things, has access to all of those underlying um, sectors and asset classes themselves is very, very important and can round, round out your portfolio from a, a tactical perspective as well as, the, you know, as you said, an alternative uh, type of strategy. So it's this is not just, you don't want to just invest into the S&P 500 and, and manage things, your history from lid in the, the lines of the Warren Buffett way of, of doing things. You know, I people can't live like that. People need to to do more. They need to learn more. And, and, and I, you know, th- there are people that don't want to do that. But I, I mean, I'm we're very supportive of the investor who wants to learn more and wants to, um, you know, not necessarily risk more, but live a little bit outside of the box. Right. So you've got you've got the democratization of finance, which Horizons is providing from a structural perspective, first and foremost, providing uh, leading edge products, uh, providing capital market enhancements to various areas like psychedelics, where that's going to create more research and more positive impact socially. Plus, you're, I think you're saying, hey, it's, it's morally presumptuous of us to not have a 2x whatever ETF it is, up or down. Because I'm going to leave that to the investor decide to decide what to do with that. Whereas most other firms will say, well, no, no investor could handle that. So we're not going to offer it, which, again, I think that comes into that moral presumption. How, how do you know that you're, you're that presumptuous on behalf of the individual investor that you should make that call? So that, that big brother type of thing, I, I, I love that you, shot, you, you, you directly go against that. I wonder... Having having you know a top ETF mind, I would say, I would say globally because it's not just Canada that you're involved with and the and the the Murray Asset Management that you know owns Horizons. I know that you're involved with that corporation as well as you think globally about the ETF sector. What do you think are sort of looking out the next five years? What are the major opportunities in the ETF space, and what are the major threats? What do you what are you seeing from that perspective as a as a global leader in the ETF space? Um, well, let me start with threats. So, I literally don't believe that there's a new investment product theme that could take away from ETFs. I think ETFs, you know, have up until this quarter of this year, I'd sold uh, mutual funds in Canada for the past four plus years in the US ETFs have outsold mutual funds in the past 10 years. I really think that the ETF will be the investment vehicle of choice going forward for investors. You're always going to have some like very private strategies and seg funds and stuff like that, that the banks will promote. And, and, you know, unfortunately our industry, the asset management industry is really controlled by the banks from a distribution perspective. They own 80 plus percent. Uh, So you're not going to be able to get away from, 
bank owned product per se, but you know, you have to give products that the investor wants to hear and talk about and, and is something that is top of mind every day. And I, and I think we're again, being innovative and first to act with that type of thing. Um, so ETFs are here to stay. Um, you know, we have fee changes, regulatory changes that are happening every single day. And I think those are only going to be beneficial for leveling the playing field and increasing the, the optics on ETFs for investors going forward. Um, with that as well, I mean, I think ESG is, is, again, I mentioned it earlier, it's a big subject matter. Uh, Canada is way behind Europe uh, when it comes to that. Uh, and and the U.S. is even farther behind Canada in that regard. But it's something that we have to talk about every single day. And as a, you know, our fiduciary duty is now not just a fiduciary duty. Uh, we have a social well-being that we have to think about with our investment decisions. So I think Passive investing and active investing are going to be very, very important. I think the financial advisor is never going anywhere, though. I mean, we've got the, the robo-advisors. We've got self-directed investors. I mean, we have four times the, as many self-directed accounts opened in 2020 as there were in the past three years combined. Um, you know, those are big stats when you're dealing with who is going to be investing and how they're going to be investing going forward. Um but I, I, I think there are some global themes. Again, technology is not going anywhere. It's going to change. It has changed the way we've done business uh, over the past year. It's going to change. Innovation and technology is going to continue to drive um, uh, how we invest, how our markets. It's going to you know, affect every single day of our lives. I mean, who can live anything, you know, do anything without having your phone at your hand, in your pocket all day long? You know, we're, we're on a computer, we're on video, um, you know, computers and phones and technology is, is essential to how we live our lives every single day. And that's not changing. You know, that's going to that's gonna drive the markets going forward. But, you know, we're still a fossil fuel driven, you know, culture. And uh, to the extent that, you know, electric vehicles are very important. Um, uh, but I think green energy is something that we have to be thinking about. Um, you know, you know, we've got, we talked about, uh, you, you know, uranium a little bit earlier. I mean, nuclear energy is going to be a very, very important part of our lives going forward, but battery technology and, you know, we're launching a, a, a lithium <laughs> and, and lithium ion battery technology component, uh, ETF. Oh my in God, there's enough liquidity for something like that. That's, that's uh, fantastic. H that's really an issue. That's interesting. <laughs> Okay. Yes, there is lithium producers. You know, it's so we have uranium producers. Now we're going lithium producers. You know, we're also going to be launching a hydrogen um, ETF. So hydrogen producers and hydrogen technology. Um, so HYDR is going to be an important part. We believe again of green metals, green energy. You know, fueling the future is how we sort of refer to it uh, between uranium, lithium. Uh, hydrogen. These are all very, very important parts of uh, of just what we do on a day to day basis, and how important is our batteries going to be in our lives uh, going forward? How important is hydrogen energy, nuclear energy, um, in our day to day lives as we move away from oil, not gas, coal? You know, these fossil fuels, and how bad they are on our environment. I mean, I'm I. I want my children and my grandchildren's children to, you know, to be here and be able to breathe without having to wear a, a gas mask every day. And uh, you know, we've gone through enough of that with COVID over the past year, wearing masks every day. We don't want our children and our children's children to have to, to wear those things uh, going forward just to, to breathe a normal piece of air without even being disease-free or uh, you know, virus-free and, and, uh, and, and having overcome that huge hurdle that we've had to overcome. So there's a lot of great themes that are going to be happening. I think, you know, and a lot of evolution in this, uh, in the thematic space uh, over the six months. We saw thematic ETFs in the U.S. in the past year just blow up, like just huge trends towards that space. Uh, it hasn't happened here in Canada yet. Um, it it started to happen in, in Europe. It's already happened in Asia. And I think you know, more and more thematic ETFs are going to be very, very important part of everybody's portfolio going forward. Uh, but you can't take away from the alternative type of investment as well. You know, themes are an alternative type of investment. It is a choice that you're, you know, 
actually making every day to move away from I could just earn the benchmark and if I want to earn the benchmark the benchmarks great and I'm not gonna lose I'm not taking any risk but people are have been empowered by COVID. people have been empowered by self-directed accounts and ETFs uh, and I think that's you know, just it's it, it is interesting how uh, my brother done. my younger brother asked me the other day what uh, he's like I don't understand how can there be so many advisors don't you guys all do the same thing like isn't everybody just advising if like, isn't there one optimal way of managing money and you know as I started trying to explain that what what it came down to was that every advisor has attracted a tribe that has a certain set of values and, and, and it's surprising how often individuals invest based on values first and ROI second. And I think the, the theme-based ETFs, the access to alternative strategies is really allowing the, the, the advisors and the retail investors out there to express their personalities inside their portfolios in ways that simply did not exist when you had – the monolith bank at the top telling their advisors what they needed to invest and their advisors just dropping that down. That still exists, and I think more in Canada than anywhere else. But hopefully, you know, these themed ETFs coming our way will help Canadians express themselves much better. Well, I mean, I, 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 a great example to, to, to take that thought one step further, Rod, is, is really – asset allocation ETS or balanced funds, right? Like just the very simplest strategy, it needs to have X percent of US equities and Canadian equities and, and government bonds. You know, we built our suite of, of balanced funds, asset allocation ETS back in 2018. But we, you know, we said the way of the future is going to be different. People are going to want income still. And this is a very, very low interest rate environment probably for the next 25 years from a cycle perspective. People are going to be living longer because healthcare continues to improve and people need more income, people need more return at the end of the day. How are you going to do that? Investing in more fixed income? No. You know, you're going to have to increase the allocation of equity. So 60-40 is like, I say it and I'm happily going to say it, 60-40 is dead. It is really dead. Like that is not how you have to structure a balanced portfolio. I mean, we made ours like 70-30 right out of the gate. If you want a growth portfolio, it's not 80-20, it's 100% equity. That's a growth portfolio. And guess what? When you're looking at U.S. equity, it's not just the S&P 500. What is the, what is, what's driving returns in U.S. equities? The NASDAQ. So we put, you know, NASDAQ 100 exposure in our balanced funds. And guess what's happened? Our balanced funds have destroyed all of the other balanced funds from a performance perspective because we have overweighted them when we should have. We put alternative investments, broad-based indices into these because we should have. And we're looking out for the end investor here. Like, But guess what? People still gravitate towards the very, very simple to understand base strategies offered by several of our competitors who we are like a balanced fund outperforming on a one-year basis by 10% or 12% or 15%. That's not really something that people have ever heard of ever before. But guess what? It's happened. And But people have mm -hmm. a very different mindset of investing. And, and some people are, you know, not thinking about the future, just thinking about, let's just play it safe. And we'll do it the, the simple way and the normal way that people have always done it for the yeah. past 50, 75 years. And 60, 40 is the way to do things. And I'm going to be very, very risk adverse. And, and you know, some people work that way. I think the majority of Canadian investors yeah. are starting to wake up. And this past year really, really helped them uh, move that, that mindset forward. I think I think um, you, you know. Speaking of advisors and and investors, you know, ad advisors are craftspeople. You know, they they're builders, right? You you know, you all have access to the same tools, right? Like like a, a whole stable of ETFs at Horizons, for example, or or you know, the industry itself, and you know, just like some craftspeople build wooden boxes and other craftspeople build fine Swiss watches, right? You either, you know, you have a hammer and nails and you can build a box uh, or you have, you know, you have a whole set of very sophisticated tools and you, you can build uh, a finely made 
you know, a finely tuned watch. And, and so, you know, maybe, maybe the hammer and nails is some of the simpler thematic uh, focused ETFs which, which allow you to do or buy a basket of one kind of security. But then you have, you, have, uh, you know, the fine watch, the, the, the finely tuned Swiss watch, which is, which is like what Resolve is doing, right? Which is like what you guys are doing, building very finely tuned portfolios. And every advisor is a craftsman. They, 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 they can build a portfolio which can be a very simple you know, wooden box, or but they look, can build I, a portfolio yeah, that can I, it's be. It's been ten years ago. You uh, couldn't do a that. finely tuned. You could watch. only build a wooden box. It's been amazing and how how the technology yeah. has grown. Exactly, I, I think there's a huge. There's still a, a, a massive learning curve, as you said, Steve. You know, the sixty forty it's portfolio dead, is dead. dead. Just to totally be clear, uh, it's but not how just many? Dead. How many? It how many dead, investors? Dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Totally. <laughs> It didn't even dead cat back. <laughs> but Peter, like, I, would, I would say, like to, to well, your point, like financial advisors have also like they are relationship people. And like when I first met Mike, he was a client. He was a financial advisor, and he was working with a group of guys, and yeah. you know they were using our products as tools. Um, but his client base, from my perspective was built off of Mike yeah. and his personality and his outgoingness. And I loved going out to dinner with Mike and some of his clients and bringing him along and the stories he can tell yeah. and stuff like that. He's got, he's got 10 times the personality <laughs> that I do. I wish, I wish I had one tenth his personality, I'm not sure about that. but to that end, <laughs> when, when, when he got together with Rod and Adam and I, you know, I sit down at a lunch with these three talking heads and I'm like, how are these guys going to work together? That's just not going to happen. Like that, they all are strong personalities. They're all their own, their own boss. And there's just no way that these guys can collectively work together. They proved me wrong. You know, they, they actually are, they're a great team and they work together and, and, uh, and you know, they, they collectively uh, have some great inputs from an advice perspective for, you know, our clients for financial advisors to hopefully listen to from a tools perspective. And, and I just wish that, you know, there was a, a BNN reporter talking about adaptive asset allocation, uh, you know, at least five or 10 minutes every single day on TV rather than marijuana. You know, every single day there is an interview on yeah. marijuana, right? But there isn't on adaptive allocation. There really <laughs> should be. There really should be on balance. There really should be on 60 40. They, but the, the, the stories go where, you know, they're going to get the most readership yeah. and viewership. And, it, and It's and, a lot more fun to talk know, about and, thematic than it is the, 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 uh, the boring long-term allocation to the, the risk that they can get over 15 years <laughs> yeah. for sure. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I mean, my, my, I love talking about ETFs. I love talking about derivatives because a lot of our business is built on derivatives and structure and tax efficiency. And I love talking about marijuana and psychedelics because they are so – uh, interesting from an ultimate end user perspective, and there's they're topical, yeah. and and there's something that you can bring up and have fun with. And they they the challenge the current paradigm too, which is I think one of one of your strengths, Steve, well, is that you're not afraid to to challenge the paradigm. And I think as you mentioned earlier, Rodrigo, advisors form tribes, right? You're you're managing a utility function of a group of investors that have a certain view, and a good advisor takes into account. You know, what, what is the proclivity for the end investor to want to have a portfolio of these thematics and then balancing off that against what is a responsible structure of a portfolio with an allocation to more normal base type portfolios and, and making sure that that client feels fulfilled through the expression. And, and of I think what's what often people miss in that That's, tribal view is you know our value system at Resolve is to to make sure that our investors actually have the you know the best re realized risk adjusted returns and what does realize mean it means that what are you going to stick to long term right i can give you the best mathematical equation the highest sharp portfolio but if you don't get it and if you're not you don't believe in it and it's not part of your value system and you go through a rough period you're going to abandon that is incredibly quick. So when you are an advisor and you establish a tribe, and let's say it's an ESG tribe, right? And ESG is not guaranteed to outperform everything. But it's if you have a tribe that cares about that stuff, you're more likely to have them stick to it long term, which is almost like all of the battle. It's being able to stick to a methodology and a strategy long term. And that comes down to belief systems and it comes down to being part of a tribe 
that is that that is part of you know your day-to-day conversation so this is it this is this is the important part you don't need to strive for max sharp you need to strive for max, max stick to itness and and all these tools allow you to to create those tribes it's a, it's a great it's a, it's a great new world and you know what I, you've said the um, hawk that covid has changed a lot of things i'd actually never heard that before i i think i understand why but why do you think covid has made this much more um, uh, has advanced <laughs> the mission of these using these unique tools more for the general society. Uh, honestly, it's empowerment. Like it really is. Like investors are at home. Investors have more time on their hands to actually pay attention to what's going on. People are like, oh my god, fees actually do matter. Why am I paying all of these fees for this mutual fund, this simple balanced mutual fund, when I could be in something else that for you know, one-tenth the cost and, and better returns. Um, and it's like, well, I can buy that myself. It's an ETF. You know, I don't need to be invested in the um, this large bank balanced fund when I could be invested in this, um, you know, high growth technology ETF or, or and, and I could create my own portfolio. Again, ETFs have really empowered investors. Self-directed investing has changed completely. And I don't think it's going away. I think there were always be a mindset of people that always need financial advisors. Uh, people need somebody to hold their hand. People need somebody to talk to, uh, to uh, help. And, and you guys do that a lot uh, from an end investor perspective. And, and, uh, and But this investment landscape is significantly knee-jerk reactionary. Um, and e- there's guys like you and funds like you which are you know pra- proactive and, and not reactive. And, and unfortunately, a, a lot of the investment landscape out there is reactive. Um, and and people, when when people's self-conscious, when people's gut reactions, um, uh, you know, take effect with respect to their investment decisions, unfortunately, it's usually the wrong decision. Uh, and we need people that can stay the course, that can believe in a strategy, have a mindset, use a financial advisor to help hold their hand, stay calm, not make rash decisions uh, when it comes to to changing things, when they're actually, you know, the, the capital markets is always going to be, there's always ebbs and flows. Um, and just people saw that a lot more proactively last year, but but COVID itself, I mean, right, I mean, the governments and, and um, you know, stepping in and supporting the entire capital market ecosystem from stocks to bonds, putting more money in, in um, the the end Canadian and U.S. investors' hands and, and giving them the opportunity to make investments. I mean, that that, that thing is mm-hmm. that has never happened before. And there's just been more money flooded our system in the past year. And all of it is from the governments at the end of the day. And that, you know, QE is going to end at some point in time if it hasn't already. And, and um, uh, But so much money has come into the system. Um, and people are chasing returns. People are... Um, re- being reactionary to positive returns rather than, um, you know, negative reactionary to negative Steve, returns. How, how are you or are you seeing that uh, the flow, the massive flow to passive investing, changing the market structures at all? We, we've certainly heard a lot about that in the U.S. markets from guys like Mike Green and Corey Hofstein about how these passive flows, ongoing, systematic, are impacting the allocation to you know, companies within the indexes. Are you paying much mind to that? Are you seeing that at all? Are you seeing that in Canada at all? Or is that, is that a bit of a U.S. phenomenon? Is it, is it passive investing gone too far? Or, or what are your thoughts there? I don't think passive investing can go too far ever. Um, you know, there's, there's just as many active mandates that are competing each, each, against each other for performance in dollars and investment in these companies. Same with passive investments. There's more... Uh, indices in the world than there are individual stocks listed, right? Like you can slice and dice this world in so many different ways. Um, but I, I, I can't think of, you know, will this uh, fixed income market be driven by this bond ETF and, and ebbs and flows um, into this bond ETF? I don't believe that that's the case. I think the capital markets itself is too efficient for that. Um, per se. I mean, I think there can be points where it could be a little bit more scary and, and you need to be a little bit more timely when it goes to getting in and out uh, of different things. But I think the new active is really the asset allocation of passive. 
per se. So, uh, and, 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 you know, you guys do that well, like rotating from asset classes, rotating from sectors. That is the new active. It's not this picking one individual stock or this one individual bond over another. It is really the overall um, adaptive asset allocation, as you guys put it. That's, from my perspective, that's active. That's the true active, and that's the way that active should be looked at going forward. And really, ETFs, either from an overall theme perspective, like what where we are with HRAA, or with the S&P 500 versus TSX 60 versus NASDAQ 100 versus Russell 2000, I mean, those are individual ETFs and strategies that you can use inside your own asset allocation. And again, that's where, that's how ETFs have empowered the investor. It's like, I'm going to overweight tech. I'm going to go to the simplest and easiest. I'm going to go to the NASDAQ 100 or the NASDAQ composite, right? Like it's just, I, I, NASDAQ, you know, I did a presentation six months ago. I said, the NASDAQ is the new S&P 500. And the S&P 500 is the new Dow Jones, like when it was. Like, nobody invests in the Dow Jones anymore. <laughs> What's right? the Dow Jones now? The S&P <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it's, it's on my screen yeah. right here. The Dow 30 is right there. I'm looking at it every it won't single die. day. Because right? it's a fantastic <laughs> momentum it system. Still there? Oh, I don't tough know. To beat, man. Tough to beat. But, <laughs> it's part of the 60-40 portfolio. <laughs> dead, dead. <laughs> Amazing. What, uh, what, wow. So, I, I, again, I just, you know, to finish that thought off is asset allocation is the true active. It is the new active, and it is the active as I see it going forward um, over individual stock picking. And, and I hope that investors' mindset changes and we're helping try and promote give us uh, give us one. I, we're we're we're, cut, we're, close, we're over an hour now, but I'm wondering if you could just give us one more thing, which is what what would you think is your uh, top unexpected surprise for the next twelve months in markets? Oh goodness! We're we're going to publish this uh, in the Golden Mail, by the way, and then again twelve uh, months from now. Besides, no, this is this is this is not advice. I, I have ten G's on on you being right. I don't even know what you're going to say, but I know how good you are. So just so you know, <laughs> um, if people are looking for stable long-term uh, investment returns. They should not be looking at cryptocurrencies. Uh, you know, I, I looked at it as cryptocurrency as an asset class that I can play from a day-to-day -day volatility perspective. We're going to see and continue to see huge volatility in the cryptocurrency plays. And if people want to make bets, and, and, you know, ETFs have made it a lot easier for people to make bets on cryptocurrency, which is why we launched an inverse Bitcoin ETF, you know, there is, there's a lot of opportunity to make very, very quick returns. And, and you know, uh, but again... Cryptocurrency is going to continue with huge volatility. It's going to be up and down 5%, 10% on a daily basis. Um, and it, it, But it's never going to be a real asset that is backed by something tangible at the end of the day from a need perspective like oil or net gas or gold or equities. Um, you know, you have to look at it as truly alternative. Don't bet your life and your future on cryptocurrency. Um, that That's the one, uh, I guess, overriding is there's just been too much hype to the sector, which uh, there's so much risk to uh, overall. Um, I, I like people who can trade cryptocurrency and actively trade cryptocurrency, but not everybody who invested in cryptocurrency at $10 and it went to 60000 actually made money. You know, there, there's a lot of people that lost money during that process. So... Um, for us, I just it, like the Canadian investment landscape, uh, I, I think, is just continuing to mature every single day. Um, I love the empowerment that ETFs have given investors, per se. I, I think our ETF industry, which is now over $300 billion, um, is still a lot less than the 10 plus trillion um, in the U.S., um, but we're going to continue to grow very aggressively. Um, and, I, and I think that investment landscape is going to be driven by ETFs. So, you know, Canadian investors, you need to open a self-directed account. You need to open an RSP, you know, to open a FSA. And you need to start buying. Start simple. Buy, buy, buy yeah. an ETF that somebody does the work for you, like an <laughs> HRAA, where you're taking the risk off the table. You're buying a professional management. They'll let them make the mistakes. But... 
much less mistakes than you would make as an investor. But you need to learn. You need to start and you need to do it somehow. And I think that it's a matter of signing a piece of paper or clicking an online form to open an account and putting a few bucks in there and and, uh, and, and putting it to it. work and just Excellent. watching, learning. And you need to stop thinking. You need to stop thinking that you can successfully balance your portfolio on your own. I, I don't. I can't balance my own portfolio, and, and I'm yeah. and I'm a professional money manager per se kind of thing, right? Yeah. Like I, I make mistakes all the friggin' time, unfortunately. Um, and I, I have a part of my portfolio which is very very passive, run by an investment um, advisor friend of mine, and and uh, she does a great job. Um, but I don't move that portfolio around. That's the core. And then I play on the fringes and, and probably too much so over the past year, kind of say. But, uh, uh, you know, I've made a lot of money uh, investing in cryptocurrency and investing against cryptocurrency, investing with marijuana stocks, investing against marijuana stocks. You know, it's, it's uh, um, but I only use ETFs, you know, and uh, I use ETFs for every single investment I've made over the past 10 years. Because I think that you can get access to any sort of underlying sector, asset class exposure, positive, negative that you want uh, to be able to uh, make a decision and, and profit from. All right. Excellent. I love that. I think that's probably a natural break point for the final question, Pierre. <laughs> oh, boy, there's more. So, uh, yeah, there's one more question. This wouldn't be raise your average if we don't ask this question at the end. Steve. Would you rather spend a week in the past or a week in the future, and why? <laughs> I've never had that question before, so let me think about that for a second. I mean, there are, uh, I, I love the, the time of the early 1900s and the way of life and, and um, uh, just the way that people lived their lives back then. Uh, but long before the 30s, but I don't want to be ever involved in a global war, you know, dealing with World War One and World War Two and the pre and the post and all of that stuff. Um, I, ju I just couldn't handle that. Um, so if I could avoid those periods of time and just um, enjoy life and, and, and be successful in, in at those times, um, I would love to be able to take, you know, it's like, you know, I'm a 50 year old now and, and it, you know, I would love to have known everything that I know now when I was 18 years old, right? And, and how would you have lived your life differently if you were that smart or that, that well seasoned from a knowledge perspective, you could avoid making the many, many mistakes that you do, um, you know? So, but that said, I think there's so many things that we need to look forward in the way that we um, live life going forward. Um, you know, the, the improvements that are to our medical system and health system every single day. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a guy who has back issues for a 50 year old and it, you know, there's no spine replacement surgery. There's no disc replacement surgery right now, but what could there be in five years and how much better could all of our lives be better without mental illness, without back pain, you know, um, and, and if these things can be solved easier and, and more efficiently in the future, like I would love to live 20 years from now when I could go into a doctor's office and he could give me a pill. And you and me both, brother. Disc in my back. You know, like Can't wait. that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be. <laughs> so I think there's some positives and negatives, Peter, but if I had to pick one, I would probably want to have the knowledge that I have now and go back to the you know the nineteen uh, nineteen ten uh, would be uh, yeah. you know and, and, and the first cars and and uh, and uh, the way of life that they had back then. Awesome, uh, very entertaining. Love the old movies. Love it. And the pandemic. Yeah, go <laughs> go through the Spanish flu and the pandemic too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, thank there you. Go. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? When you when you can you know think like if I could just take all that knowledge that I have now back to then, right? Well, what I feel like we're going to live for a hundred more years. So we're kind of, you're kind yeah. of in your twenties right now, given where the way technology is going. You're good, baby. You're good. 
Yeah. You're, you're going to crush it over the next hundred years of your time at Horizons. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Love it. Steve, thank you so much. Steve, right. thank you so much. Guys, thank you very, very much for having me here today. It was lots of fun as always. And, uh, you know, I hope, uh, I hope that your clients and the viewing public uh, uh, can enjoy this discussion. I hope they can actually sit through my rambling. We loved it, man. Uh, They're going to love it. Awesome. Thanks, Hagen. Thank you so much. 